Welcome. The Havinghurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies turns 20 this academic year. The first conference we convened was held in Oxford, Ohio in March 2001 on the theme of imagining Russia. A number of prominent scholars came to campus to talk about the state of the field, the field being broadly imagined and inclusive then and now. And we thought we'd use our 20th anniversary in 2020 and 2021 to reimagine what we know through a series of YouTube conversations. Today's guests are Helena Gashilo and Bradley Gorski, and we're going to talk about what's new in our understanding of Russian literature and culture and what we should be reading or rereading these days. But first, let me introduce our two guests before we get to the conversation. Helena Gashilo is professor of Slavic and East European languages and literatures at The Ohio State University. She's a force in the field for all who know her, publishing numerous articles, chapters, books, translations, and edited volumes on topics including visual culture, gender, folklore, culture, the Russian novel, celebrity culture, and much, much more. Her more recent books include a co-edited volume on Russian aviation, space flight, and visual culture with Vlad Strukov, a study of the ex-enemy in Russian and American films, co-authored with her sister, and an edited book about Putin as a celebrity and cultural icon. She's also been a frequent guest at the center. Bradley Gorski is a force in the making and someone we'd love to have visit us here soon in person in Ohio. He's assistant professor of Slavic languages at Georgetown University, his alma mater. He's currently working on a book entitled Cultural Capitalism, Literature and Success in Post-Soviet Russia. Based on his dissertation, it looks at four authors who have found innovative pathways to prominence and asks what success means for each of them, how they've pursued it, and how their own success has changed the nature of the literary field. Bradley has also published on Soviet post-war subcultures, science fiction, and medieval festivals in contemporary Russia. So thank you both for joining me today. And let's start with what you're each working on right now. Um, Helena, tell us a little bit about what, you, what you're working on right now, and then Bradley can tell us a little bit more about this book in progress. Okie doke. Though I have to say something before that, and that is the fact that the department at OSU is Russian and East European Languages and Cultures. To change the word in our title from literatures to cultures took about two and a half years while I was chair. So, and I consider this my major achievement as chair, okay? What am I working on, all right? Uh, today, we are, Beth Holmgren and I are supposed to get our um, proofs for our book, Polish Cinema Today. And I have actually moved very significantly to Poland. Um, because quite apart from that book, I have several chapters written on another one called FFF, um, which is <laughs> Feisty Film Fam, F-E-M-M-E-S, which is about Polish women directors. Okay, And then I'm also orchestrating a volume on the Slavic film musical, because this is a genre that never really took off in a major way. Uh, either in Russia or in Poland. And these will be the two countries that are involved. I'm also writing um, an article for a volume orchestrated by two younger colleagues on horror. And I will be looking at horror in the artwork of two absolutely amazing young Polish artists, Ewa Juszkiewicz and Aleksandra uh, Waliszewska. But... Let me pass the buck to you, Bradley. Okay, great. Uh, those those projects sound fantastic, um, and and I'd love to hear a, a lot more about them. Um, the book project that uh, Stephen uh, mentioned a second ago is called Cultural Capitalism, and it, it grows out of the dissertation. But I've actually added it quite a few more uh, authors and and uh, organized it a lot more thematically rather than than by author but the the focus of it is this sort of first decades in in post-soviet russian literature and I, i'm trying to understand how the system of cultural production kind of recovered how it rebuilt itself anew after the soviet union's disintegration so i'm really interested here in this sort of institutional side of the literary undertaking it's economic and material aspects which i think have been overlooked sometimes by researchers on this period Post-Soviet literature is so often conceived of as kind of a search for new identity or a reckoning with the past, 
or an exploration of the new freedoms uh, uh, in, in the post-Soviet state. And it is absolutely all of those things, but it's also, and I think really importantly, it's the cultural adoption of an adaptation to capitalism, both as a mode of cultural production and as a way of life. So in the book, I look at sort of uh, a lot of these capitalist developments really closely. I look at the creation of the post-Soviet bestseller, for instance, the importation of the British Booker Prize as the Russian Booker, um, the rise of success and meritocracy as sort of new master narratives. And what I find is that capitalism has actually played a really central role in both the institutional and the aesthetic development of post-Soviet literature. So much so, in fact, that the system that I call in the book cultural capitalism, which I should say develops not through any sort of centralized project, but mostly in a kind of ad hoc patchwork way. This system becomes the dominant mode of post-Soviet literature such that by the mid 2000s, when a new kind of avant-garde begins to emerge, um, a new sort of uh, uh, movement against the system around figures like the Stodielet group uh, and Kirill Medvedev, these groups kind of position themselves first and foremost, not against political power, not against the sort of Putin regime or against a dominant aesthetic mode like postmodernism or something like that, but instead against capitalism itself and specifically against capitalism and culture. So I, I end the book on, on this note, which I think is, is important because it shows, I think one of the things that um, post-Soviet literature and culture has to offer um, a lot of the rest of the world, which is that because the development of, of what, you know, Frederick Jameson and others have called late capitalism is so con compressed in this post-Soviet period, that uh, you don't have this, uh, this sort of sense of capitalism's inevitability as a lack of alternatives, right? Uh, Russian writers and thinkers in the sort of, uh, you know, mid 2000s and a little bit later don't have this thing which, uh, you know, theorists in America have called reflexive impotence, the idea that imagining a different way out of capitalism is impossible. Um, they've seen something different sort of in the recent past, and they have this sort of toolbox to imagine alternatives. And I think that that's one of the things that's really interesting about looking at capitalism and culture in, in Russia at this moment. Don't you think that in the 90s, quite a lot of authors actually embraced capitalism in the sense that all of a sudden there was this explosion of people like Marinina, Detsenka, and so on, right, who decided right away that they wanted to make money, right? And started looking at, okay, detective stories, crime fiction, pseudo romances, and so on. Actually, um, when I was reading your uh, article on bestsellers, I was reminded of myself 900 years ago, when for the Harriman Institute, I wrote an article actually on this, which I called in distinction you know, uh, from you, big buck books, okay, Pulp Fiction in post-Soviet Russia. And I wrote this in 1999, and this already was quite late in these capitalist developments. And they started individually, but then they really accelerated. Okay? Yeah. And I agree there was no sort of movement of organizations or institutions, but certainly when people, if you looked at the streets uh, during the 90s, you must have been in diapers then, right? Well, during the 90s, I remember very well, there were all of these goods being advertised, which no Russian could afford. So it was all the people who came to Russia who could afford them. And so well, you had somebody like Marina now who worked for the police, for heaven's sake, right? Who became very popular, right, uh, with her crime novels, and then um, I I don't remember my own article very well, I have to say, because it was a while, it was what, over 20 years ago, but I remember it, it dealt with a lot of women writers, and this is one thing um, that you actually, interestingly enough, deal with gender in your medieval celebration um, article, though not explicitly, because it was actually the first time that women, okay, uh, became dominant in certain spheres, which uh, I found fairly exciting given Russian history. Yeah, this this is a really important uh, aspect of this whole capitalist development. So 
you know, you get uh, at the beginning of the 90s, even before the fall of the Soviet Union in 1999, there's the, the law on printing, Zakoni Pichetti, which finally lifts all censorship and also allows uh, independent publishers to publish printed mm -hmm. material, right? This is before yeah. the end of the Soviet Union, but this is the sort of watershed moment, at least in, in, in the printing world. And this allows uh, new printing presses and new new publishers mm -hmm. to pursue profit. And profit was the new method of viability, not political uh, acceptability, mm -hmm. right? And this opens these floodgates. You get a whole, you get a ton of new publishers within the first three years. Uh, I, I think that that's the, the correct statistic. There are 4,000 new publishers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, there, there's this huge uh, desire to publish uh, profitable books at the time. And the, the most profitable books at the very beginning time are imports, right? Uh, so there's there's a lot of imported, um, usually pirated translations, often from the West. Um, and those are marketed as already bestsellers in the West, so they should be bestsellers here. And this is before Russia has either the apparatus to measure bestsellers mm -hmm. or anybody mm -hmm. writing bestsellers at home. Um, and so bestsellers become a category even before they're, they're measured as such. Um, but by the time the bestsellers as this sort of statistical category developed in 1994, you get people like Marinina very interested in the genre conventions of these categories and how to sort of redevelop them, uh, situate them within the, you know, uh, reality of, of 1990s Russia and sort of reformulate them. Uh, for for that environment, so yeah, there, there's there's a lot of this um, uh, of of uh, these sort of homegrown bestsellers mm. that take some of their models from from Western imported bestsellers, but they they modify them in really really interesting ways. And one of the interesting ways is a a huge gender split. So you have a lot mm -hmm. of the, the women, <laughs> right? But then mm -hmm. you also have um, all of these uh, uh, action thrillers. So the the uh, Bishini series, the the Mad Dog series. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, and, and I used to read those and laugh myself to sleep. I remember. <laughs> I mean, these these are fantastic. And so you, one of the ways in which these sort of uh, international bestsellers are domesticated is by actually heightening the gender contradiction. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And mm -hmm. that's a really interesting moment. I also think a significant moment is when television starts picking up on these. I was just yeah. going to say, I'm reminded in Bradley's story here of how, how close the parallel is to movies, where the blockbuster becomes a thing in Russia, Absolutely. and in, even the word blockbuster becomes a, adapted entirely in Russia. There's no change. It's, it's uh -huh. blockbuster. Um, uh -huh. Around by the time of the late 90s, for similar reasons, just like bestseller becomes a Russian word adapted entirely from the English. Uh -huh. I, I guess I'm curious, for Bradley, um, maybe... Tell us a little more about one of the authors you explore in this book, you know, who, who fits the paradigm in a, in a way that I think you and Helena have set up. And then I'm, I want Helena to, to talk about this Polish cinema case and how, how it reflects post-communist, post-socialist, uh, you know, trends much like the bestseller in Russia. Yeah, so this is this is a really interesting question. I, I like all of my authors, but I think one of the ones that I'll, I'll talk about is uh, Olga Slavnikova, who is who is a really fascinating uh, figure. Um, and uh, she uh, is actually in, in the early 90s, she is working in the thick journal Euro uh, based in Yekaterinburg as a as a sort of new um, editor and, and book review editor there. Um, and she becomes really interested in these new uh, prizes that have come up, these literary prizes that have come up in, in post-Soviet Russia. Um, and as book editor, she's actually one of the first people who organizes the book uh, review section of the, the journal Ural around those books that have been shortlisted for the Russian Booker Prize. Um, and she does this the year before her first novel comes out and itself is shortlisted for the Russian Booker Prize. And she had sort of uh, seen her career in con uh, in, in um, concert sort of with the rise of this Russian Booker. She often talks about in, in interviews how the, the shortlisting of her debut novel as, as a Russian Booker uh, um, uh, finalist was really launched her career. Um, and then she, each time another novel came out, 
uh, she would give interviews where she would tell people, you know, I think this one is the one that's probably going to actually win the Russian book. This is the one that's going to get there. And finally, in, in 2006, her, her novel 2017 um, did win the Russian book of prize. And from there, uh, she uh, has moved on to not only working with the Russian book of prize, she served on its jury a couple of times, but then she, she actually helped to found a new prize called the debut prize. Which, which uses the prize system in order to find new writers um, and writers who haven't been published before and sort of bring them to prominence in a way that she kind of sees as her own uh, uh, path to success. The reason why I find this really interesting is because the Russian Booker Prize is a very specifically capitalist prize. Um, the Russian Booker Prize was actually started at the very same time as another prize called the Triumph Prize that was started by Berizovsky and his fund. But the Triumph Prize was was based on um, sort of socialist principles in which um, a sort of broad based support of the arts would be the main goal of the foundation. Um, so it would pick winners, but the winners would be announced sort of not in a Oscar like ceremony with with tension and scandal around it, but would be announced in the newspaper and people would be given given their prizes in a public ceremony, but also the, the foundation would support struggling artists who couldn't uh, uh, support themselves. The Booker Prize, on the other hand, was built on a uh, media-based scandal model that had been developed throughout the, the British Booker Prize uh, history. The British Booker Foundation, in fact, is, um, is founded on uh, the money that had been harvested from uh, Caribbean sugar uh, plantations, which um, has its own colonial history in, in, in um, British colonialism, um, which is a thing that John Berger actually pointed out when he won the prize in 1976, uh, which created a scandal around the Russian, uh, around the British Booker Prize, but also uh, increased the prestige of the Booker. So all of this sort of scandal, media attention, the, uh, the long list, short list, uh, and journalistic discussion around um, the Booker Prize was imported into Russia very specifically. On top of that, the Booker Prize, as its mission, um, tries to increase the saleability of its winners. So if you go on, on the, the website of the British Booker Prize, it will tell you statistics about the sales increases. When Marlon James, for the History of Seven Killings, uh, won the Booker Prize, his, prize, his uh, sales went up 876% we are told, in the week after he won the prize. Um, and the Russian Booker Prize does something very similar. It says as its founding mission that uh, part of the reason for this prize is to make sure that, um, uh, that literature with uh, high uh, cultural aspirations will be able to survive against the glossy covers in store windows these days. So this sort of buying into and in fact trying to overcome the capitalist book market is intrinsic in the prize itself. And this is one of the reasons why I think the prize became the most prestigious prize in this in this capitalist infused 1990s. And one of the reasons why uh, authors like Olga Slavnikova saw this prize as their way to move from somebody with high literary aspirations to somebody who's actually culturally prominent and very central to the, to the literary culture. I suspect Helena is going to tell us what she really thinks about Slavnikova. But, you um, bet. <laughs> but uh, I, I should point out my... my colleague, dear colleague, and Helena's former student, Ben Sutcliffe, does like her and has actually um, took a trip to Russia with students and had them meet her. And she spoke to, to them about uh, her work and all that. But it's, it's fascinating. You're absolutely right, Bradley, that, that this is something quite new in Russian culture that is itself an important aspect of post-Soviet literature. There's this, this prize system and what it means and how it confers sales on authors. My, my wife uh, worked for for many years at the Cincinnati Book Festival, and once you win something like a mm -hmm. Pulitzer Prize, or you're shortlisted for a Pulitzer Prize, you're you you almost can't be afforded anymore. In, in the level well, it's not it's not unlike the Oscar with which uh, Bradley contrasted the announcement, right, of the Booker Prize. Uh, I think Olga Slavnikova is uh, a very good organizer, a real chinovnik. Uh, who doesn't hesitate to push your way through to things. Um, I don't think her books are even, I wouldn't even, I'm not sure I'd even call them real literature. To me, it's sort of cut and paste prose. And especially, I actually was asked and did translate the first Booker Prize, which went to Mark Hariton of Lini which was very complex, uh, very pomo and so on. 
Um, and that year, I remember Sarokin, Petrushevsky, and various other prosiest came up for the prize. I think he was awarded it in part because it was just so very complicated. You know, I think very often people like to give prizes to things that they don't quite understand because it seems very elevated. Anyway, it was, it's the most difficult translation I've ever had to do, and it was a long novel. But um, I actually also um, was asked to uh, comment, do a blurb for Marion Schwartz's um, translation of uh, Slavnikov's Bismietne. Mark Lipovetsky got me into this, which I'll never forget him. Okay. And um, as usual with uh, Schwartz's uh, translations, there were lots of mistakes. And I ended up sort of dissociating myself from the whole project. I think it came out of Columbia University Press. Yes. Uh -huh. Why the press chose to translate that particular novel totally eludes me. I hope you had nothing to do with this, Bradley. So I apologize if I'm offending you. <laughs> I had nothing to do with this. I should say that one of the reasons I find Slavnikov is such an interesting uh, example for this particular project is uh, because of the, the quality of her prose. Uh, there's this big debate that goes on around the time that she is between her shortlist and her winning of the prize about Booker prose. Um, and uh, Natalia Ivanova is, is one of the critics who's really interested in whether the Booker Prize and the prominence of the Booker Prize is actually changing the way that writers write, because there's a type of prose that is more acceptable for the prize. Um, and so one of the things that I do in the chapter with Slavnikova is I actually do trace the, the quality of her prose and how it's developing from her, her first book uh, to her later work. Um, and I think one of the things you can see is that it does change. Her prose changes very significantly. And in the, the first work, which is uh, A Dragonfly the Size of a Dog, is, is uh -huh. the translation in, into English, um, her sentences are almost exclusively uh, passive sentences, uh, um, imperfective verbs. Um, and they're long sentences, very descriptive. It's hard to sort of pin down where reality is and where sort of memories and, and uh, internality is. Um, and by the time you get to her Booker winning 2017, you get a much more active sort of what we would call muscular prose. Uh, in, oh, in God, the, Bradley, no, spare me. <laughs> this is one of the things that is actually one of the features of the Booker prose debates uh, with, with Ivanova and, and some other um, some other critics at the time, they're trying to pick out these things that will help people win the prize. And her prose actually moves in this direction. So this, this I, I hadn't thought of her, her prose as particularly cut, cut and paste, but expressing it in that way does make me think of um, how a lot of authors, and not just Slavnikova, are susceptible to the types of conversations that are going on around the criticism of different developments in uh -huh. prose, and how those conversations are often tied to as well the institutional and economic developments around the literary process as well as the prose themselves. So we like to think of, of literature and literary criticism as this sort of you know Kantian disinterested uh, aesthetic uh, uh, judgment, but it is actually deeply tied up with uh, institutions, economics, uh, and, and all of these aspects, which I think I try to tease out a little bit with Slavnikova, and I think that's one of the reasons why I like her so much as an example in this in this particular. Well, she's a boy baba, no, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm struck again, like by the way, Bradley, with the parallels to cinema here, because you know, uh, the for example, in the the Russian film critics circle that when they award their White Elephant every year, they have similar debates. You know, do we to what extent do we pay attention to movies that have been commercially successful that are still artistically good? Um, mm -hmm. To what extent do we award films prizes like like Mindadze's uh, Dear Hands, which is virtually unwatchable, mm -hmm. um, so slow and boring, but it won the White Elephant because um, the film had gotten into trouble with Medinsky, the cultural minister, who refused to okay. accept it. So it seemed like the, the, the right political thing to do. Um, and I do want to loop back to Helena, though, because you know, I do think Polish cinema offers another interesting case study here because it's been quite successful of late. In all kinds of measures, that is artistically successful. It's won prizes, Academy Awards. It's won because European it's Academy. very good, Stephen. So t tell us, yeah. Well, one of the reasons I have really shifted my interest from Russia, um, I think one of them is my endless hatred for Putin and what has happened to the country. Um, but another one is connected actually with Beth Holmgren, who's you know she's a Slavist at Duke. 
she and I have co-edited uh, books together, and she asked me several years ago whether I would be willing to write about a Polish film with her. And I was always reluctant to work too much on things Polish, since at home, uh, though my parents both knew Russian and Polish, father learned his in one of Stalin's inimitable camps, okay, um, the household language was Polish. So when I went into Slavic, I was determined not to do it the easy way. Okay, But I thought, well, why not? She and I had done a book uh, on Polish culture, Polish women's culture many years ago, and I've been working on film. And so I said yes. And now it is very difficult for me to watch any Russian film. Uh, Polish film is bloody good. And it is recognized as that internationally. As a matter of fact, surveys of the best film schools for the last, I think for the last six years or so, I could be wrong, always cite the Łódź Film School as either the second or the third best in the whole world. Geek never even gets a mention in the top 20. Okay, uh, And I understand why, having watched an endless number of Polish films in the last couple of years. So what we did for uh, Polish cinema today, we took uh, films that we thought were good or interesting, okay? And we arranged our book by topic. So we have the church, uh, then we have the Jewish issue, okay? We have um, crime, uh, we have gender and sex, uh, also have homosexuality, uh, also immigration and um, workers uh, abroad, Polish workers abroad and so on. And so we divided our eight chapters, Beth has three, I have five, and we, in the process, um, we learned an incredible amount about the infrastructure. Let me give you an example. Um, whereas the uh, you know, ministers, Ministry of Culture okay, publishes every year, right, which kinds of films thematically will be funded, right? And they're the predictable sorts of things, you know. Uh, basically, Russia's history, if it is in the correct mode, okay, um, then success stories, right, sports, heroes, etc., um, then um, multi-ethnicity, or one could say a lot about that in Russia, right, and so on. And, of course, you cannot speak real Russian on screen because you cannot use all of the words which are just so rich, such as governor yet, which is one of my favorite words for Putin, okay? Uh, the Poles, however, went very differently. The government in 2005 established um, an organization called, it's called PISF, that is, that's the acronym, okay? Um, and despite the fact that the current ruling party in Poland has the acronym PIS, okay, it has not interfered with this. Now, the organization that was established in 2005 does absolutely everything it can. It funds films, it educates audiences, it ensures that there are regional prizes, regional funding, and so on. In other words, the government is hyper-supportive of film, no matter how it looks at things. So Polish film actually confronts some dreadful past incidents. Okay? It actually has homosexuality, uh, Shumovska, who is one of the bright stars, whose films are very uneven, in her film, In the Name of Dot, 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 uh, dramatizes the psychological problems of a gay priest who fights against his love for a young man, but who finally succumbs when that young man pursues him. It actually shows the couple in bed and waking up, quote, the morning after, and so on and so forth. Uh, Olga Chaidas has a film called Nina, which is a lesbian film. Okay. She is Holland's uh, daughter-in-law. Okay. Holland's uh, daughter, Katia Danik, is a uh, gay. Anyway, so it shows how a woman who's not satisfied with the marriage and so on actually ends up in a 
lesbian relationship with her surrogate uh, sort of carrier of a child. In other words, there is nothing that is forbidden in Polish film. Now, I know that there is this theory that caveats and prohibitions, right, censorship, creates great art. That used to be one of Tatiana Polstaya's favorite notions. I don't see that happening in Russian film. The other day, I tuned into the webinar on Sputnik. That's Abramika's new film. I don't know. Did you listen to that? I didn't, but I know the film. Yeah, I think the film's fairly awful. It, it's very, very weak. It is a clone of Ridley Scott's Alien. Now, I happen to teach science fiction, and I've taught Alien about at least 20 times. And there was this young fellow, young graduate student, who was saying, oh, but Sputnik is more complicated, it does many more things, which only showed me that he doesn't really know Alien. So I think that there is a tendency for some people who work in Russian film especially, where they feel they have to say things are good when actually they're either weak or simply not good at all. Okay, Thank God one is spared that if one works in Polish film. Okay. So I am thrilled to have shifted westward. And, and that's why I wanted you to speak about it, because it really it is interesting in the ways you describe the later that here you have two examples of two post-communist states that have both turned more authoritarian as the years have passed. But in the one case, the Russian case, that turn toward more authoritarianism has also been accompanied in the cultural sphere, especially with cinema, mm -hmm. and, and others, and, and a much more interventionist policy, as you described. There's a list of the preferred topics, whereas in Poland, that hasn't been the case with cinema. Not at yeah. all. And also in the literature, look, one of my favorite writers nowadays, believe it or not, is Olga Tokarczuk, right? Um, and I read a very early novel of hers, which I didn't think was that good, but then I've read, um, oh, a collection of stories, then also one, Bigunia, which is translated as flights, and then another one is Drive Your Plow Through the Bones of the Dead, which is a fantastic murder mystery, okay, in which you have this uh, woman who, like um, Tukatruk herself, is a vegan, she lives in the countryside, she's an engineer, okay, and she finds that men have been killing animals, okay, including her dogs. She, she performs a Clint Eastwood move. She enacts vigilante justice. She kills those bastards. Okay? And then she crosses the border to the Czech Republic. Now, can you imagine this happening in Russia? You know, that kind of text with a woman, a woman who does this, and then a woman who writes about this? You know, I just, I just don't think it would be possible. But my argument is that one of the problems in Russia, and I've said this countless times, if I've said this to you, give me a kick when we next see each other, I think one of the problems in Russia is that Russia never had a renaissance, okay? And in some ways, I think the heritage of medievalism is still operative. After all, Peter took Russia by the throat, you know, right, in the early 18th century and wrested it from medievalism. And I was fascinated by the um, article on the medieval festivities uh, in which I take it, as you say, predominantly men take part, which doesn't surprise me at all. It is one of the few ways they can really recapture something. And it's also one of the few ways they don't have to be castrated by Putin. Okay? So I think this atavism, and, you know, which, is, which of course now has this patina of research and so on, and the fact that scholars engage in this, that doesn't make it any less truly medieval in many ways, as far as I'm concerned. I will now give the floor to both of you for at least yeah. 10 minutes. I, I love asking at the end of these for recommendations on in the field and what we should be reading or watching. And Helena, in her own inimitable way, has given us, you know, watch more Polish cinema and read more Polish literature. Absolutely. So Bradley, let, let's, you have the last word here. I, I want to hear more about your take on Putinism as expressed in this, uh, this, this neo-medieval turn in the, the these uh, Renaissance festivals that you've talked about, but also a couple recommendations of what's excited you in the field uh, to close this conversation. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, these, these medieval festivals, which uh, I, I read a little bit about, um, 
in, in an article that came out in the Russian Review last year or two years ago. Um, these are really interesting sort of phenomena. Um, I, I was turned on to this actually because one of the authors I researched for my book uh, puts one of them on. Um, so Alexei Ivanov, uh, who came to prominence uh, based on a couple of, uh, an, a few novels, but a couple of which were based in the sort of pre-modern Urals. Um, uh, the first of those was in the 14th century Ural sort of colonization by, by the uh, Russian imperial powers. Um, and it's called the Heart of the Parma. Um, and the year after that came out, he started a festival, um, a medieval festival on the site of one of the battles featured in the book by the same name. And by the time I had heard about this, uh, the festival was attracting between 20 and 30,000 people mm -hmm. annually. Um, so I went to Perm to, to check it out. Um, it's in the northern Perm region. And I met a bunch of people there who were not only going to this festival, but who spent most of their summers traveling around to different medieval festivals throughout Russia. And it turns out this, uh, this movement for historical reconstruction, which is what they call it, um, is an enormous subculture throughout Russia. Um, and- uh, Britain too. What's that? The UK, the UK also. It's empires that are no longer empires and have this. It's it's incredible, right? And it's it it is it is worldwide and certainly Europe wide. But um, the the biggest festival in Moscow bills itself as the the Europe's largest festival of historical reconstruction, um, and it happens every year. Uh, it used to be contained in Kolomenskaya Park in in southern Moscow, um, but now it is uh, sort of out in, in, in the rest of, it's on the Boulevard Ring and, and other parts of, of Moscow, as well as Kolomensky. And that attracts up to 500,000 people annually. It is an enormous, enormous undertaking. Um, and so I wanted to sort of try to figure out what is going on here. What is so attractive about this type of activity? And, you know, put a different way, what is missing from the rest of the world, these people's everyday lives, that they sort of seek it out in this? Mm -hmm. Um, and obviously there's some sort of pushback against modernity going on here, um, some sort of dissatisfaction with the modern world uh, and, and romanticization and valorization of a, of a pre-modern way of existence. But at the same time, as soon as you scratch the surface, um, there's actually a celebration or at least high utilization of uh, modern technology. So they really insist on the authenticity of the historical uniforms, uh, sorry, costumes. Uh, not, some of them are uniforms, but some of them are civilian costume. Um, and the wares that they produce, they really insist on sort of uh, historical fidelity here. But at the same time, they encourage everybody who's at these festivals to take out their iPhones and take videos and pictures and, and, and post them on, on social media. Uh, all of these festivals have really slickly produced uh, advertising. Um, and many of those advertisements include digitally created magic. So there's dragons, there's <laughs> sorcerers, stones that light up. Um, so this sort of uh, uh, drive for historical fidelity is blended with a celebration of magic, digital reality, and sort of imaginative play. It's a really interesting and really fascinating set of, of uh, circumstances here. It's like children's computer games a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, they're, 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 uh, it, one of the things that's really interesting about this is that the, the movement of historical reconstruction traces its roots back to the late Soviet period. And a uh, professor at the um, St. Petersburg State University um, whose first name I'm blanking on, but Sokolov is, is his last name, who's a Napoleonic uh, war historian and was a uh, um, reconstructor, which is what they call themselves, of that time period. But at the same time, the um, live action role playing of the Tolkien novels was also huge. Um, and these two, these two tendencies kind of blended with each other. And now the reconstructors, they look down on the role players, Roliviki, which is what they call them, um, as, as a sort of, you know, detached from reality. But nevertheless, they've brought in some of the fantasy from that Tolkien universe into this historical reconstruction. And one of the things that I think is really interesting about this is that the historical fidelity is, is not sort of pushed aside for the fantasy. They're blended really seamlessly. Um, and what I ended up positing, at least in the, in the article, is that these, these festivals offer people a space to not sort of articulate their relationship to the modern world, right? It's not a thing where you're, you're asked to produce language about how you feel about living in a, a, a world of globalized capital. Um, 
but it's a way of embodying and enacting a different kind of way of being. And it's, it's a really interesting uh, way that this sort of aesthetic project blends with a kind of political critique, but on a non-discursive level. And as uh, Helena mentioned, this is heavily inflected with retrograde social values, especially gender values. Um, so the, the worlds of these uh, medieval festivals are uh, heavily hierarchical. Um, hierarchy is usually based on physical dominance um, and sort of received social structures. Um, and not surprisingly, this uh, uh, coincides relatively well with the Putin government's um, uh, uh, sort of general outlook on um, uh, Russia being a bulwark against the West uh, and the decadence and uh, uh, effete and emasculinized, uh, uh, emasculated West. Um, and so when you look into this, these historical festivals and the clubs that sort of support them throughout the year are heavily government funded. So government funding from the mi local ministries of culture is the number one funding for, for all of these festivals. And it's a really interesting way in which this sort of ministry of culture policy, which Helena was mentioning in relation to film, um, has has a different outlet, one that is, is not related to these sort of large cultural products that make their way to the West in translations and Oscar nominations and things like this, mm -hmm. but that actually have a real effect on the way that people interact with their- Grassroots. Uh, what's that? Grassroots. Grass, grassroots in some way? Grassroots movement, yes. Yeah, yeah, they're grassroots movements, absolutely. And they're, they're, they're fertilized from above, but, but the, mm -hmm. root, the roots are real. Um, and so I think that that's a really interesting uh, way that sort of aesthetics, politics, and the social world kind of come together in this in this fascinating way. Um, as it, I, I will take in the last two seconds, uh, Stephen's invitation to to plug a couple of things which I think are, are really great. Um, one of them is the recent spate of translations uh, still coming now of Maria Stepanova uh, and her work. So the the uh, British poet Sasha Dugdale has has translated. Uh, in Memory of Memory, which Stephen is showing us right now, uh, which is, uh, I've, I've only read about 150 pages of the translation, but the translation seems really beautiful. And the book has already sort of in the last two or three years become really one of the classic works of prose of the 21st century in, in Russia. So definitely worth checking out. Uh, Duke Dale has also undertaken a translation of a number of, of uh, Stepanova's poetry, uh, which will come out, uh, I think, a little bit later on this year. And there's a book of essays and poetry by a collection of uh, about 10 different translators coming out with Columbia University Press um, a little bit later this year as well. Um, so Stepanova seems to be having a moment and I would suggest that uh, English language readers really catch on to that moment because she's, she's one of the really talented uh, mm -hmm. uh, voices in, in today's Russia. Um, there was a great so, article, I think, in the New Yorker about her having a moment or something, uh, you know, a, a major journal about Stepanova and all the things that are coming mm -hmm. out right now. So it's a great recommendation. Um, you're, it makes sense, by the way, Bradley, the the Renaissance Festival or Medieval Festival in Russia has has some inspiration from Oleg Sokolov. That's the that's the person oh, who, is, who is himself a murderer. He murdered his graduate student, which is a, a story for another day. But another day too, I now realize I live in the northern suburbs of Cincinnati and Helena lives in the western side of Columbus. And in, in between those two spots, closer to me than Helena, is the Ohio Renaissance Fair. So oh, Bradley, when, when normality resumes, you'll come out to Ohio and Helena and I will take you to the Ohio Renaissance Fair and we'll see how it compares to the medieval times of, of this, mm -hmm. um, this place you visited near Paramount. Right? I suspect <laughs> there'll be lots of parallels there, um, that's but awesome. that's for another day. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Helena and Bradley, for mm -hmm. joining me. This has been a real pleasure. It was fun, Stephen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for the invitation. This was great. Thanks, Stephen. Bye-bye, both. <laughs>